Hi there, my name is Roy McEwen, and I work at the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, the School of Graduate Studies is the umbrella organization within the university that supervises the uh, delivery of all graduate programs. Uh, we don't run our own graduate degree programs. Those are run by almost 90 different graduate units throughout the university. And we use the term graduate units because we work with the Institute of Medical Science. We work with the Department of Biochemistry. We work with the, uh, that's a good example, the Center for Medical Studies. So institutes, faculties, departments, anyone running a graduate degree program is a graduate degree. What are we going to talk about today? I'm going to tell you a little bit about the University of Toronto, some of which you probably know, so don't worry. That's just the marketing. Uh, we're going to talk about the questions you should ask yourself in determining whether graduate study is for you. I'm going to talk about the different degree options at the University of Toronto. And we're going to talk about some tips for finding the right program or programs. So let's do a quick overview of the University of Toronto so you uh, have a bit of orientation to what we're talking about. We have three campuses home to over 90,000 grad students, including over 20,000 graduate students. In terms of graduate study, we have 400 areas of study with over 300 graduate degree programs and 40 collaborative specializations. Collaborative specializations are something very special, so I'm going to talk about them a little bit at the end. Uh, they're not degree programs, they're something that students in the graduate degree programs and also sign up for to enrich their study. We're located in Canada's largest city, one of the most diverse cities in the world. We do have world-class research facilities. Our undergraduate students have access to tools, to facilities that graduate students all over the world can only dream of. So where some universities struggle to let their graduate students work on gene sequencing, our undergraduates are like editing genes which is kind of fantastic. We also have the third largest library in North America after Harvard and Yale. So we've got an enormous amount of holdings in terms of books, journals, maps, uh, databases that students can access uh, that other students at other universities don't have access to. But there are some key takeaway points to applying to graduate study at U of D that I really want you to hear. Graduate studies are very decentralized. This is absolutely true at most universities and incredibly true at the University of Toronto. So if you're looking at the admission requirements or the application deadlines or the program structure for one program, that's great. Do your research, find out what you're getting into, look at what you need to know. But remember that that won't hold true for other programs. So if you're applying to psychology, Great. Look into what they were looking for. Uh, but if you're applying to physiology as well, the application is going to look very, very different. The other information I want you to know is that everything you're looking for, honestly, everything I say today, is available for you online. But universities are not always the best web designers. So you may have to burrow through a few different sites before you get the information you need. Don't let that turn you off. Go out there, find the information that you need to make your application. And then, as you might have guessed from my last clue and the, the one before, everything you want to do to apply to graduate study is going to take you more time than you think it will, and the deadlines may come earlier than you realize. So, give yourself a lot of time. If you're looking at applying for graduate study for next September, give yourself time and start working on it. So what's the difference between undergraduate and graduate study? I'm going to stereotype. Uh, if you're in undergrad, you've had some fantastic uh, seminar courses, I'm sure, but not that many. And the dominant mode of delivery of your education has been the lecture. When you're dealing with a lecture, you've sort of got a creator of knowledge, the, the prof at the front of the classroom, delivering that knowledge to the consumer, the students, and the audience. And that's a generalization, I appreciate that. Um, but that is the dominant mode of teaching delivery for undergraduate studies. At the graduate level, the dominant mode is the seminar. 
and in seminars, it's students who are actually going in, ferreting out the material, delivering it to their classmates, and they're part of the instruction. Um, that is the dominant mode of teaching at the graduate level, and that means that the teacher-student relationship is very different. You are a junior colleague to your professors. You are involved in the delivery of the, of the education. You are a researcher alongside your professors. And that means that the relationship, as I said, is very different between you and your professors. This is a collaborative model. This is a model where students are involved in doing independent research and delivering that research to their classmates. So deciding whether or not graduate study is for you means a certain amount of infrastructure. I'm not here to tell you, go for it, sign up for graduate studies, apply today. I'm here to tell you, ask yourself a certain number of questions. What are your goals? Where do you see yourself in five years time? And how do you get to where you see yourself in five years time? Some of this you can't actually ask from university staff members or faculty members. Uh, you actually need to go out and talk to people who are doing what you want to do. That could be uh, messaging someone on LinkedIn, that could be contacting a friend of a friend, contacting a family member of a friend, and just finding out what it is that you're going to need to get to where you want to be. And you need to know how much time you're prepared to commit to further education how much money you're prepared to get for their education, and why you want that education in the first place. Is this to advance your career? Uh, is this because you're just super, super keen on a given subject? Are you looking at a career in research? So let's start with the easy answers. Um, we have a huge number of professional master's degree programs at the University of Toronto. And I personally like to divide these up into two different groups. There are the master's programs that are absolutely essential if you want a particular profession. So if you want to go out and be a social worker and you don't have a bachelor's of social work, guess what? You're going to do a master of social work. No question. No question at all. Uh, if you want to go out and do certain other professions, though, uh, if you want to work in in the financial markets and in risk management, you don't necessarily need a degree in risk management, but it can certainly help. So those are two different kinds of professional programs. One where it's absolutely 100%, this is what you need to work in a profession, and one where it's just very carefully designed to help you advance in a certain niche in your career. Either way, uh, these programs usually take one to three years to complete. They are usually course based, but will sometimes include an internship. Uh, and you can see from the list that I've provided that you know, we've got a whole huge range of these at the University of Toronto. Uh, some of them, as I said, are absolutely set up to work to, to prepare you for a particular work destination. So the Master of Social Work is that a great example. Uh, and some of them are just assigned on the basis of. Uh, our faculty members and the alumni experience to help you prepare better for a particular profession. You don't necessarily need a master of engineering to be an engineer, but that's a range of courses that you can take and a range of professional development uh, courses that you can take that will help you advance in that profession. Research based master's degrees uh, are sometimes a little trickier to work out. Um, they all have some coursework content. Uh, some may be entirely course-based, but those courses are really, really research intensive. Some may have a thesis project or some may have a major research project. Um, and traditionally, these programs were designed as sort of the testing ground for a PhD. If you want to do a doctorate, do this degree, do this master's for one or two years, and see if you're really geared for it. But there are all sorts of other applications for these degrees. Uh, we have a lot of teachers who come back to get a real deep dive into their specialization. 
So if they want to teach history uh, and you want to advance themselves as teachers, they enrich themselves with the subject matter in the research based master's degree. Uh, the one difference between research based masters and uh, professional masters is the availability of funding. Usually we assume that you know, if you're doing a professional master's, it's an investment in your career. And so there isn't a huge amount of funding available. In research based masters, there may be funding. Um, certainly in Master of Science or Master of Applied Science, so sciences and engineering, uh, doing a lab-based research master's, there's usually funding available, not 100%, but quite often. In a Master of Arts, so in humanities or social sciences, uh, it, it's very variable how much funding there is, but there are definitely merit-based scholarships that you can use to help fund your degree. And here's the big the University of Toronto is a research institution, and PhDs are basically what we're built for. Um, doctoral degrees are generally expected to take four to five years. Uh, an exception to that is the Doctor of Juridical Science in the Faculty of Law, where students are expected to finish in three years. And these degrees were originally intended to prepare students for academic careers. The idea was you would do this and you would go on to be a researcher in this. It's not always true. Um, students often end up in a wide range of alternate careers. So a lot of our PhD students end up in policy development for the government. They end up in consulting. They end up in independent research. Usually these programs are only available to students who already hold a master's degree, but some programs do allow for direct admission to undergrad. And almost all of our doctoral programs have funding available for students. There are a few very new professional doctorates that don't have that option, but for the most part, if you're willing to do a PhD restriction on a given topic, the department that you can see will provide funding for you. We'll talk about that funding in just a moment, but let's talk a little bit about finding the right program. Um, the School of Graduate Studies website gives a very comprehensive list of what programs are available, but that's not necessarily the same that that's the best place to start. Um, we have, just as an example, a lot of neuroscientists at the University of Toronto. But if you go to the School of Graduate Studies website and try to look up a PhD or a Master of Science in neuroscience, you're going to come up empty. So that's just because we don't have a department of neuroscience at the graduate level. But we have so many researchers working on neuroscience. Uh, they are in the Department of Psychology, the Institute of Medical Science, the Department of Kinesiology, looking at rehabilitation from uh, concussions. Uh, like I said, rehabilitation. So they're also in the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute. So our researchers are not necessarily going to be exactly where you think you will find them. Um, so if you're interested in a research-based program, uh, rather than looking at the School of Graduate Studies website, just Google your research interests and the phrase University of Toronto and see what comes up. You may be surprised. You may find researchers working on things you did not expect. Uh, in departments where you would never have expected to find them. Um, we have three psychology departments, which surprises a lot of students. We have one in the Faculty of Arts and Science, one at the Ontario Institute of Science and Education, and one at the University of Scarborough, and they're working on different specializations within psychology. We also have psychologists in uh, the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, which you might not have expected, but they're there. Uh, doing industrial psychology and organizational development. You'll also have psychologists working on similar issues in the Rotman School of Management and the Center for Industrial Relations Between Resources. So remember not to limit yourself by granting, but look at the topics that you're interested in and see where they might be housed in different departments at the University of Toronto. So if you do look at our program, let's say, at the School of Graduate Studies, 
The most important information you'll find on our programs pages are the links back to individual graduate units that are offering those programs. Don't look at our information as final, look at it as a starting point and go back to the information. As you're doing that, you can review what's involved in the program. Is it going to meet your needs? Look at the courses that are available. Are they courses that you are interested in? Is there a thesis involved in this program? Uh, if there's a thesis involved, do you need a supervisor when you apply? Do you find a supervisor in the program? These are important points to consider when you're deciding whether or not a program is right for you. Another very important question is whether or not you can afford this, and if so, how? We'll talk about funding in just a second. And then finally, as I have suggested, uh, you might want to consider whether or not you can expand the program that you're looking at by adding on a collaborative specialization. What am I talking about when I talk about a collaborative specialization? So I indicated earlier that we don't have a department of neuroscience and we don't have a master of science in neuroscience at the University of Toronto. But we have a whole lot of neuroscientists doing really impressive research in the subject area. Just because there's no degree program doesn't mean you can't study neuroscience at the University of Toronto. We have what are called collaborative specializations. Uh, they're designed to break down the barriers between different departments and programs or different degree programs at the university. And these are a major point. This isn't the sort of thing that you can do at a smaller university um, or a less diverse university. I'll use neuroscience as the example, and I'll give you a few more examples of that. So if you want to study neuroscience, and you don't have a Master of Science in Neuroscience, you can go and study your neuroscience topic in any number of different programs. You can go to the Department of Psychology in the Faculty of Arts and Science. You can go to the Rehabilitation Science Institute in the Faculty of Medicine. You can go to the Institute of Medical Science, also in the Faculty of Medicine. You might want to go to the Faculty of Nursing. If you're a nursing degree that specializes in patients with neurological difficulties. And if you're doing that, you can apply on top of your degree what's called a collaborative specialization. They're not degree programs, they're not formal certificate programs, but they are an additional program that you take on top of your degree. So say you apply to the Department of Psychology and you also apply to collaborative specialization in neuroscience and you accept it to both. Great. One of your courses will be the introductory seminar in neuroscience. But in that classroom, as you sit down to that introductory seminar, your classmates are going to come from a whole bunch of different disciplines. They might come from pharmaceutical science, rehabilitation science, physiology, um, and you'll be going through an introduction to neuroscience through that interdisciplinary lens with classmates who have very different backgrounds than yours. You'll choose your electives carefully to make sure that you're doing neuroscientific options in your home program. And if there's a thesis, you'll do a subject that is related to neuroscience. And when you graduate, congratulations, by the way, you'll have both your degree and a certification in neuroscience and a collaborative specialization. And this won't cost any more money than it would cost to do your program. And it shouldn't take any more time than it would to do your degree program. It's not just neuroscience. You have these specializations all across the disciplines. Uh, we have women and gender studies as a collaborative specialization. We have aging and palliative care. We have uh, book history and print culture. We have Jewish studies. We have sexual diversity studies. We've got about 40, 40, around 40 of these specializations that you can take on top of your and if your degree program isn't formally affiliated with a specialization yet, you can actually ask for that affiliation. So 
how do you apply? How do you get in? What's involved? I'm only going to give a very, very, very brief overview because every program has different admission requirements. So I'm going to give you what's required university wide for master's and PhD admissions. And the next slide is color coded. Okay. So what you need to get into master's programs, we say you need an appropriate bachelor's degree or equivalent with a final year average of at least mid B from a recognized university. Now, mid B from a recognized university is in the That means that's a school of graduate studies requirement. That's something that SGS determines. We determine whether the university is recognized or not. And if you're not getting your undergraduate degree from a Canadian university, we also have equivalency scales available on our website so you can make sure that your grades meet that and be required for its program. I put appropriate in red because it's up to individual graduate needs to determine what sort of undergrad training is appropriate for their program. Let me give two examples. Uh, if you're applying to the Department of Computer Science, they just care that you have a really strong math background. They figure they can teach you the programming that you need, probably. Um, so they're pretty open to what is an appropriate bachelor's degree to come in and study computer science. Economics, based on experience, has determined no, nope, if you want to do economics, there are a certain number of courses you need to have taken to be successful in your master's at the graduate level in economics. Uh, so they're quite fussy and picky about who are they going to look at. And they provide a list of those courses on their website to let you know, are you an appropriate candidate for your program or do you need to take additional courses at the undergraduate level? For admissions to doctorates, you need an appropriate master's degree or its equivalent with an average of at least B plus. And again, if you're taking courses outside of Canada, you can always look at the equivalency tables uh, on the School of Graduate Studies website or de demonstrated comparable research competence. Some units will allow admission from the undergrad directly to uh, the PhD, but if you want to do that, you need at least an A minus in appropriate courses. And again, look at the unit's website to see what courses they're looking for. And if you're doing your undergraduate degree outside of Canada, take a look at the uh, International Credential Equivalency Database on the School of Graduate Studies website. Beyond this, different departments will have additional requirements. You've just heard from Sunny for the last little while about, uh, about uh, standardized testing and the preparation of things you can offer for that. Uh, so a department may ask for standardized testing, then they ask for writing samples, they may ask for a research statement that you know what what's your thesis going to be on they may ask you to find a supervisor so make sure that you're looking at the requirements of the individual graduate unit that you're applying to it's also important to remember that meeting the minimum requirements doesn't necessarily guarantee admission um, you're competing against other applicants who are very impressive as you are uh, and in certain years, depending on how much space is available in a program, really super candidates may actually not make the cut simply because the graduate unit is offering spaces to other people. So the application procedure is through the School of Graduate Studies website, except for a very few professional master's programs. Um, you'll need to submit informal transcripts, contact information for referees, some kind of research statement, or sorry, some kind of statement and possibly other requirements depending on the unit. It's important to make sure that you're going to get all those requirements in place by the application deadline. If you need to sit a GRE exam, for example, you need to make sure that those results are going to be available before the application deadline. You also need to remember that you're asking for references and your referees in time. Okay, how are you going to fund your graduate education? A one thing that's really important is to know that there are uh, awards offered by the government of Canada and Ontario or your home province um, at different levels of study. 
uh, and that the application deadlines for these awards may come before the application deadlines for programs. So at the federal level, uh, we've got the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council. Um, we've got the National Science and Engineering Research Council, or we've got the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, depending on your subject area. If you're applying to these at the master's level, the application deadline is almost always December 1st. Doesn't matter if your program application deadline is, is March 1st. The funding deadline is early, and you need to bear this in mind as you're applying. The Ontario Graduate Scholarship is available to students at Ontario universities, regardless of where they come from. Um, it has been devolved down to the university. So it used to be that applications went to a provincial adjudication. Now they go to the universities. At smaller universities, it may be a central competition. So if you apply to two programs at Brock and you apply for the OGS, you have one OGS application. At U of T, it's been devolved even further down to the graduate units. So if you're applying to physiology and biochemistry and you want the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, you apply twice because physiology and biochemistry have separate competitions for their OGS and they have different departmental deadlines. In research based programs, there may be departmental funding available. It's not available for all programs and certainly not for most professional programs. Uh, they usually require that you apply for additional awards as well. But whether or not you get them, if you're in a funded program, you will get a mixture of scholarship and either teaching assistant or research assistant salary to cover tuition plus very modest living expenses. In professional programs, a lot of our students are using student loans, so uh, OSAP for Ontario students or whatever equivalent from other provinces. And a lot of our students uh, benefit from that from taking time off between undergrad and graduate. If you're going to do this, you want to make sure that you have your references ready to go before you take that time off. Uh, because if you come back five years later, your referees may or may not remember you well enough to write a good style on this. So application tips, as I've suggested, give yourself time. And once you've planned out that time, give yourself a bit more time. This is going to take longer than you think. This is especially true this year because we are using a new application site and the various units are getting used to how to use it. So if you have any technical problems, it may take a little longer for the graduate team to get back to you. Remember that your funding deadlines may come before program deadlines. So if you're applying for scholarships, don't necessarily assume that because your, your, your program's deadline comes later, you've still got time. Your scholarship deadline may be coming up much, much sooner. When working with your referees, remember to choose your referees carefully. You need to balance out referees who are senior so that they can really speak with authority about how good you really are. Uh, familiarity, so how well do they know the work that you've done? How closely did you work with them? And how well did you do while working with them? Uh, it may be that you don't have any one referee who is, you know, a professor emeritus and a superstar in their field. And they worked with you directly on a research project. You've got an A plus 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 with them. So you're going to be asked for at least two references. Make sure you consider these qualities as you balance out who you're choosing to your references. So if you have any questions, please do get back to us at School of Graduate Studies. Uh, but also remember, we're probably going to bounce you back uh, to the graduate unit that you're looking at applying to. If you have very specific questions about uh, molecular genetics as a program, molecular genetics is your best point of contact by the School of Graduate Studies. But I am going to pause now and uh, let's go to any questions that are available uh, in the or the chat. Are there any questions for Rory? Just please put in the chat. I've got both the chat and the Q&A function open. Or so the Q&A too. Yep, either, either one works for me. 
What is a competitive average, asks Savina, for direct entry PhD? Savina, there's no really good answer to that question. Um, definitely the minimum requirement would be an alliance. Uh, so a 3.5, not 3.7 uh, GPA uh, is the minimum requirement for that. The trouble with what's uh, competitive is it depends on the year. So let me tell you a story about 2016. That was a really good year uh, if you wanted to do psychology. Psychology extended their deadline several times to make sure they got you know, an appropriate pool of applicants. Up the street, you know, only 100 meters north, it was a terrible year to apply to economics. Um, for whatever reason, 2016, every genius in the world decided they wanted to apply to economics. And people who would ordinarily have gotten in and been wooed and it didn't make it bad because that year the pool was just so good. So there's no good answer to your question. If there were a good answer to your question, it would vary from program to program. Uh, so I, I really just don't have an answer for you. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, time is up. And thank you so much, Rory. And uh -huh. And I'll give next is biochemistry, Dr. Alexander Palazzo, associate professor. I'm just gonna stop sharing or stop recording.